Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 121 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I wanted to share with you why sulfur could be helpful for your skin. I get this question a lot, and here are the reasons why. So sulfur is actually the third most abundant mineral in your body, and it is critical as a building block for something called glutathione, which is a critical antioxidant. Some people have actually called it the master antioxidant, along with homocysteine and taurine. It's also important for DNA repair because of its role in methylation. It's also important for phase two liver detox pathways that require glutathione conjugation and sulfation. Sulfates help you deal with salicylates as well. I've talked about that on the show. And sulfur supports the integrity of the skin, your ligaments, and tendons. Now, for some, they might go, wait, I think there's sulfur in some of my skincare products. And yes, topical sulfur can be used for certain skin conditions. I'll talk more about that in another episode because today I want to focus on dietary sulfur and why it's good for your skin. Knowing that sulfur is important for your skin, that means we need to know where sulfur comes from. And there are foods that actually contain sulfur. So foods that contain the specific amino acids, methionine and cysteine, are then used in your body to create sulfate. And that is ultimately the form that is used in your body to basically do everything. Now, unlike cysteine, methionine is not made in your body. So it's considered to be an essential amino acid and must be consumed in food. Methionine-rich foods include ground turkey, beef, tuna, pork, tofu, milk, ricotta cheese, and Brazil nuts. Cysteine-rich foods, on the other hand, include pork, beef, chicken breast, tuna, lentils, oatmeal, eggs, yogurt, and sunflower seeds. I figured I would take this a step further and also give you a list of high sulfur-containing foods. They include eggs, shellfish, so that includes crabs, lobster, mussels, oysters, scallops, fish such as cod, salmon, and sardines, meat, which includes beef, chicken, pork, and rabbit, organ meats, certain dairy products such as cow's milk, cheddar, Parmesan cheese, and Stilton, nuts such as almonds, Brazil nuts, and peanuts, and those veggies you probably are already familiar with such as cabbage, Brussels sprouts, onions, and spinach. It's worth noting, looking at the source that I was able to find that gave you a very clear visual of how much sulfur is contained in all of these different foods, that sulfur in vegetables and legumes is drastically less than the amount found in animal products. This probably explains why clients who eat these sulfur-rich veggies all the time are baffled when they discover through testing that their sulfur levels are low. It is highly likely that if your body is in a high demand state for sulfur, eating sulfur-based veggies alone, no matter if you eat them three times a day, might not be enough to make up for what your body actually needs in that given moment. Another point worth making is that sulfites found in certain foods and alcohol can also be converted to sulfate. This includes foods such as dried apricots and figs. It's certainly possible to get your sulfur from elsewhere, and some people do need to supplement. The most common supplement that most people know about that has sulfur in it is something called MSM. The longer name is a big mouthful, methyl sulfonyl methane right? MSM is so much easier. And it is actually considered to have anti-inflammatory properties. It can be found both in capsule and powder form. And I actually know from experience, the powder is tasteless and can be added to liquids or creams. I've previously added it to protein shakes. It's also contained in supplements with ingredients that have the word sulfate in them. 
such as chondroitin sulfate, which is often used to help joints. One thing that really drew my attention to this is that a lot of my clients who suffer with eczema also have issues with allergies. And I was able to find one really interesting small study that looked at MSM supplementation in those with allergic rhinitis. So here's what happened. The researchers recruited 18 people who had allergic rhinitis. They were provided with supplementation of MSM. So they initially each started with a single high dose of 12 grams. And then from there, they were broken into three groups. One group took one gram a day. The next group took three grams a day. And the third group took six grams a day. It was found that the three grams per day of MSM appeared to be the most consistently helpful and researchers noted that, quote, a long-term daily dose of MSM can significantly improve nasal breathing, end quote. And, quote, MSM produces fewer side effects than prescription medications such as antihistamines, end quote. Other options aside from MSM that could increase your sulfur reserves include N-acetylcysteine, also known as NAC, because it provides cysteine into the system and those supplements I already mentioned that contain sulfate. You might be wondering, though, why this is even important, because it sounds like sulfur is in a lot of different foods, and it is, but you can actually end up with low sulfur reserves. The best test to find out how much sulfate you have in your system that's available to you is through a urine test called the Comprehensive Organics Panel. I've run this a lot in my clinical practice, and it provides us great insight into glutathione and your sulfate reserves. As I already mentioned, you have to constantly take sulfur in. So diets low in sulfur-rich foods, such as vegan or plant-based, and even elderly folks can end up in a deficit. Those are the groups that are most at risk for low sulfur reserves. And certain medications deplete sulfate, specifically acetaminophen, which we know with long-term use can actually cause liver damage. And this is done through the depletion of glutathione. One interesting question that people always have when I bring up that they do really need to add some sort of supplementation into their diet beyond just increasing sulfur-rich foods is if they have a sulfa allergy. So if you have a sulfa allergy, it's important to know that sulfa and sulfur are not the same thing. According to WebMD, quote, people with an allergy to sulfa react to sulfonamide in some antibiotics and related drugs. They do not react to elemental sulfur, end quote. Now, because you're a unique, I ask you to always talk to your doctor or practitioner before starting on a supplement. I know it can be really tempting because you read about it online and all these people talk about supplements that work for them. But here's the thing, you're not them. You are unique. Your case is unique. My recommendation is to start by increasing sulfur-rich sources in your diet that obviously you're not allergic to since some of those groups can be problematic for certain individuals. If you discover that you need more sulfur, then supplementation may be warranted. As I said in the beginning of this episode, I plan on covering topical sulfur in another episode. But for now, I hope that this has been helpful. If you've got any questions or you want to check out all the research that I found on this, head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 121. That way you can look at all the references and you can leave your comments and questions there so we can keep the conversation going. And if you know someone that probably needs to hear this or has been wondering if MSM could be something good to add into their diet, please share this episode with them. And last but not least, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. That way, the next episode lands on your mobile device without you having to do a thing. And that way, you won't miss any future episodes. We've got a lot coming that's really amazing. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.